Welcome everyone. My name is Jenny Robb and I'm the curator of the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum at The Ohio State University. Before we get started, I want to let the audience know that unfortunately, Liz Montague had an unexpected family scheduling conflict and she is not going to be able to join us today live. We were able to do a recording with her and so we will be able to bring her in uh, to the panel uh, at various intervals and we do hope to do another event with her at some point in the future. Now, the New, Yorker, the New Yorker magazine debuted February 21st, 1925, and I don't think I've ever read anything about the magazine that didn't use the adjective venerable. In 2004, when then editor Bob Mankoff published the complete cartoons of the New Yorker, he reported that the magazine had published 68,647 cartoons. 16 years later, that number is pro probably tops 80,000, if my estimates are correct. So that's quite a legacy. And it's certainly quite an iconic brand. Uh, the New Yorker is synonymous with the black and white single panel gag cartoons with a caption that are a part of our popular and visual culture. But it wouldn't be fair to characterize New Yorker cartoons as completely homogenous. We've seen the magazine embrace new voices, new formats, and new ways of publishing, especially in the 21st century. So today we'll talk with the current humor and cartoon editor, as well as three very talented New Yorker cartoonists about their work and the ideas of legacy and change at such a venerable magazine. So first I'm gonna introduce our cartoonists, uh, Raz, Amy, and Liz. And I've asked each of them to show you a few of their favorite cartoons. So first up, we have Raz Chast, who brought her unique voice and cartoons that certainly didn't fit the typical gag uh, cartoon mold to the New Yorker beginning in 1978. Her work has also appeared in many other publications, including The Village Voice, National Lampoon, The Harvard Business Review, Mother Jones, just to name a few. She's also the creator of the graphic memoir, Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant, and the personalized travel guide, Going Into Town, A Love Letter to New York. Her list of awards and honors is very long, and it includes three honorary doctorates, a National Book Critics Circle Award for Autobiography and Induction into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So I'm thrilled to introduce uh, one of my favorite cartoonists, Roz, Roz Chast. Hi, uh, I'm gonna show a few of my cartoons, uh, my favorite cartoons. This one is Pigeon Little, uh, and it's obviously Pigeon walking along the street saying, the sky is falling, the sky is, oh look, part of a bagel. Next, oh, uh, this is sort of self-explanatory. I think this is pretty much uh, my attitude towards being alive. Uh, next, um, this is when moms dance. Uh, a lot of, I think probably the most common question I get uh, from people is where do you get your ideas? And a lot of times I really don't know, um, but this particular one did come from life. Uh, when uh, one of my kids was about 16, she was in the living room, she was doing her homework. And uh, if you have ever been a teenager or have a teenager, you know that there's nothing more disgusting in the sight of a teenager's eyes than an adult human dancing. It's a <laughs> repellent sight. And uh, I just wanted to see if she was paying attention. So she was doing her homework and listening to some music on, on the boom box uh, that tells you how long ago it was. And uh, I just kind of came in and I was doing this little kind of hip shaken kind of dance. And she actually looked up and said to me, mom, stop, you're hurting me. And, um, and I asked her if I could use it as a gag and she said, okay. Uh, uh, this is uh, beginning yarder. This is, uh, 
I, I grew up in, in New York. Um, I'm still really a city person at heart, but we do live up here in a New York suburb where we moved to bring up our kids like 98% of other people just following, following the herd. Um, anyway, this magazine is called Beginning Yarder and uh, we have Say Hello to Grass, What the Hell is Mulch, Rake or Ho, Which is Which, No, You Don't Want a Pool, plus tons more. And the, the main article in this magazine is, uh, this is how I feel whenever I step out into a yard, which is, so you're outside, now what? Uh, and I have to say that part of this cartoon, the idea was, um, I go out in our yard so infrequently that one time I was standing in the backyard, just kind of standing there. And my husband said, it looked so weird to see me out there. It looked like a deer had wandered into sacks. Uh, next. Um, and this is pretty recent. Uh, this came out in the beginning of June um, when we were just starting to come out of lockdown. Uh, it's called Inside. And the thing about this cover that, um, I guess is probably more unusual uh, than usual, um, is that it is embroidered. Uh, and that is something that I've been sort of um, obsessed with. I get obsessed with crafts now and then, it's different kinds of crafts and embroidery is one of the things. So it's hard to tell from this picture, but everything is uh, hand stitched. There's the chain stitch and French knots and satin stitch and various other things, but it's all stitched. And because we were not sending anything in person, uh, I laid it down on the um, on our scanner and scanned it and sent it to uh, Francoise Mouly, who is the covers ed editor of the New Yorker, and that's that's how that image came to be. Um, but anyway, that's it. Great, thank you so much, Roz. Next, we have Amy Wang. Uh, Amy's sense of humor, I just love it, and I often find myself just laughing out loud at her cartoons which she's been drawing since 1997, when she was a student at Barnard College. She was first published in The New Yorker in 2010. Uh, and in 2018, she left her career in architecture to devote herself to cartooning full time. And you can hear all about that at her fantastic TED Talk. If you want to um, take a look at that, I recommend it. She recently won the National Cartoonist Society Silver Rubin Award for gag cartoons. Amy? Um, my first cartoon. Um, this is when I, I just really enjoyed drawing. Um, it's a woman holding binoculars, um, you know, asking another woman to hold them, I guess, to look through the window. And she says, this window has a view of the park. And this idea kind of came from multiple experiences of being in other people's apartments and going, oh, this, this window has a view of the park, but it's usually like a tiny sliver or you have to crane your neck a little bit. Um, <laughs> so I thought it, this one more or less, nobody's ever done this exact view for me <laughs> where you're looking through another person's apartment, but I felt it was kind of a funny situation, a funny scenario um, that was for me, it was fun to draw. I think because of my architectural background, just being able to get the perspective, start getting the windows smaller and smaller. Um, and then you can see through the, the last window, there is a tiny little bit of the park. Um, the next cartoon, um, this is, I think, one of the common scenarios for cartoons where um, a spouse walks in on their partner having an affair or having sex with another person. And this is happening and the woman is saying to the other woman, it's not what it looks like. The sex is horrible and we're miserable. And I, I guess it, it, it kind of dawned on me that people would never have affairs if the sex was bad. <laughs> like that's the whole point of it. So um, I kind of wanted to play with that. And with this one, I, I think it's interesting because anytime I do a cartoon with a couple in bed, you have to think about who's saying, who's saying what to the other person. And in this one, I think normally the man would be saying, you know, oh, it's not what it looks like you know, to his supposed wife. Um, but in this particular, for this caption, I felt it would seem like the man was possibly lying and I didn't want that insinuation for the cartoon. I wanted it to seem completely truthful that they really were having bad sex <laughs> and for whatever reason they were still doing it <laughs> against all odds. 
Um, the next cartoon is a cat and it's an, a very old cat on his deathbed and he's telling his relatives, his family, my one regret is not napping more. And usually, I do a lot of cat cartoons and usually they normally stem from cartoons where I would normally start with a human and I would I usually switch it over to a cat at some point and it actually becomes funnier because <laughs> so it makes sense. And the caption I, I actually got from, I, use, I sometimes would message um, a cousin I have in Taipei and their time zone is about 12 hours <laughs> off from New York. So, but usually I'm doing my cartoons late at night. So I might be working like from midnight to say three or 4 a.m. But you know, that's a great time to message with somebody in a completely different time zone they're awake also. But it just so happened that I didn't nap that day. <laughs> like previously, so I was like too tired. I was like, I, I have to go to sleep. So I, I told him like, you know, I, I regret I, I didn't take a nap because otherwise I would have I would have been able to stay up and, and chat with you. <laughs> so that's kind of, that was sort of the genesis of this idea. And the next cartoon, um, it's two women on a museum bench and um, one says to the other, I like this cartoon because it has a bench. And I'm, I'm not really sure, I know where I, where I got the idea is actually at an art museum, I guess I went home later and um, I came up with the idea, but I don't, I don't, to me, cartoons like this are so simple, but it was very popular and everybody loved it. But for me, I think when it's so much, it seems so simple, but at the same time, for me, I'm, I don't, to me, I don't know if it's that funny to myself. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure. I, I guess because, I mean, it does make sense. I mean, I did see people sitting on a bench at the art museum and I thought, oh, they're just sitting there because they're tired. Um, but I think when I come up with ideas that way, it doesn't seem that funny to me. But I think it's funnier to other people <laughs> because they're seeing it for the first time. But what is interesting about this cartoon is um, I, I actually drove into the city on a weekday morning as meeting up with a friend. And I remember sort of regretting meeting deciding to meet up with her because I, it literally took me like one and a half hours in traffic driving there and i didn't realize it and i started to um think like oh my gosh i, sh I just should never have planned this because i'm just like stuck in traffic i'm gonna be there for maybe an hour and then i have to get back home um but it ended up being you know it turned into a cartoon idea and then it generated a lot of royalties for me which is very nice to have so in some ways i don't regret that trip at all. <laughs> so there's these, you know, these things that you start to think, oh, why did I do this? It's going to be horrible. Um, or, it, you know, I had to sit in traffic for that long and it actually, you know, it did generate, good generated from it. Um, my next cartoon, um, it's a woman and she has like all these papers. Um, I kind of drew them as um, like legal contracts, legal documents. Um, you can see it's like she, you know the page is really long so it's like a legal size document lawyers actually do work with long sheets i think <laughs> um but this woman she's saying not only have my eyes glazed over they have turned completely into cinnamon rolls and her eyes they have cinnamon rolls on them and they kind of look like eyes i guess it, it kind of plays on the whole kind of when you're going crazy your eyes are kind of in that swirl shape, kind of like you're going a little crazy, but at the same time, it plays on the whole, you know, when your eyes do glaze, do glaze over. And I, I remember I was doing legal stuff with one of my lawyers for, for, for child support related things. And, um, <laughs> and I remember looking through the documents and you, know, and you have to like read them over and over and they make one little change and you have to read it all over again. And I remember telling her, like, can you explain it to me? My eyes are glazing over. <laughs> so, and for her, her eyes don't glaze over. She's a lawyer, but, um, but I just, it was kind of stemmed from my experience of having to read these like legalese for like over and over and over again. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amy. Mm -hmm. So Liz Montague is up next. Um, her first cartoon appeared in The New Yorker in January of 2019, which was just eight short months after she graduated from the University of Richmond. She's likely the magazine's first black female cartoonist. And I love that she uses her humor deftly to make us think about issues like representation and social justice in the environment. 
After recently leaving her job as a graphic designer, she's been pursuing cartooning full time. In addition to her work in The New Yorker, she's the creator of the Liz at Large comic, which previously ran uh, weekly in the Washington City paper and can now be found online. And she's also currently working on a young adult graphic novel for Random House. So uh, we had Liz go ahead and record um, her cartoons if we want to play that. Um, so here are some of my cartoons. Uh, I remember this one really clearly. The caption reads, now show him protected, now show him protected sea levels on his golf course. And it's just two kids talking to a tied up man. Um, and I don't, climate change is something that I'm really passionate about. I make a lot of cartoons about this, about social justice issues, climate justice, and all of that. And this was, I think, the first one that I did that was about climate justice, climate change. So really happy with this one. Uh, the next one um, is, I, the caption reads, I said not to touch it. And there's a woman's hair bitten off somebody's hand. This is something that happens to me all of the time. Oh my gosh, especially I have naturally curly hair. I get a lot of hands in my hair all the time. And I was one day I was just like, what would happen if, if my hair could fight back? And then this cartoon was the result. I was, I was like really pleased that Emma actually published this and, and picked it. I was just tickled about that. Um, the next one, the caption reads, Looks like progress, but it's too soon to tell. This was a daily that ran right after uh, Kamala was announced as the VP pick for Biden. Um, and I'm like, uh, everybody go out and vote. I was super jazzed about that, that she was uh, picked. And I remember like reading online though, everyone being like, oh, we're, we're saved, you know, we did it. And I'm like, no, not yet. Everybody needs to go out and vote and not get, you know, too comfortable just yet, you know, there's a lot of time between now and November, you know, stay on task. And so that's kind of what that was about. Um, then the next one, it's a little girl reading a book and it says, how to teach your parents sustainability. Again, climate justice, climate change, something I'm really passionate about. Um, it was nice to be able to put this in there. Um, and I really liked how I drew the stuffed animal. Emma, Emma always tells me I draw good stuffed animals. Um, and then the final one, uh, it's two women preparing to go out and protest, and the caption reads, just ignore it. My white friends keep checking in on me because they think racism is new. Um, this one ran just after the murder of George Floyd when there were tons of protests happening, a, a, a national reckoning kind of with race in America and all of that. And it was, this was kind of like a brutally honest one, but I think it was super necessary at the time. Um, and I'm really proud that this ran and that I got, you know, the Black Lives Matter in there and the I Can't Breathe written on the, the button and on the sign. And so just, just really proud of this, proud of my work here. Uh, lastly, I'd like to introduce a very funny lady, Emma Allen. After graduating from Yale, Emma wrote for Art News and the New York Observer before joining the New Yorker in 2012 as an assistant editor. She took on increasingly bigger roles uh, up to humor editor, which included the role of cartoon editor starting in 2017. So welcome, Emma. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I think you and I uh, are both very fortunate in that we have some of the rarest jobs in cartooning. There are not very many cartoon curators and there are not very many cartoon editors. Uh, so I touched on in my introduction, but maybe you can tell us more about how you ended up where you are today and the reception that you got from the cartoonists when you took on that role. Um, how I ended up there. Uh, crazy good luck. It's, I can sort of like make a through line now that seems like it makes sense, but uh, at the time, I don't know, just working very hard and caring a lot about humor and art. But uh, yeah, so I started out of school. I worked in art journalism which was largely just me lampooning the art world in various columns in The Observer and elsewhere. Um, and then I was lucky enough to come to The New Yorker and work for Susan Morrison, um, helping her on Shouts and Murmurs and Talk of the Town, and then helped launch Daily Shouts, which is our online humor vertical, which I then took over and worked very hard to bring um, all these new voices in comedy to the magazine um, there because the magazine's biggest problem always with humor and cartoons is the real estate issue because there's one spot for shouts and murmurs every week, maybe 15 uh, cartoons in an issue. And meanwhile, we're getting thousands and thousands of submissions from great people. And there are so many great people out there working in stand up and 
um, various other comedic performance and written uh, comedy uh, mediums and then also in the comic arts. Uh, so yeah, you know, I was, I cared about art, I cared about comedy and it all just the stars aligned. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, I think David and Susan and people at the New Yorker recognized that I cared very much about bringing new voices to this story publication that already has a stable of, you know, these incredible people who are masters at this very rare sort of dying art form. I mean, dying in that it doesn't have a lot of venues left for it. Um, but that it's so beloved and um, so powerful and that there is an ability to make it like vibrant and new and uh, fresh. Anyway, that was part one. Part two was how I was received. Um, I thought I lived in total fear. I think I was like in like a blackout fugue fear state for the first year in this job because I was meeting all of my heroes, you know, like George Booth, Raz, these people, I was meeting them for the first time. Um, trying to convince them that I had their interest at heart and that I cared about their work and most of the time understood their work um, and that I would be an advocate for them, uh, even though I was a pipsqueak. And, uh, and I thought that they would all sort of laugh in my face and like I would be on the ground, they'd be kicking me with their boots. But it turned out that the life of a cartoonist is one that is terrifying and precarious. And they were all, for the most part, anxious that I would not like them. And so it was a lot of just like sweating and stuttering across the table from people, from my heroes, uh, only to learn that they were all delightful people and that, you know, be reassured that I was in this incredibly like blissed out situation where I got to work with them. So we know that the New Yorker receives far, far more submissions than it can actually use, as you, as you pointed out. Um, but I've read some interviews with you and you said that you're really trying to move away from just the simple, uh, you know, look at a cartoon, yes or no, accept or reject. Um, and I'm interested to know, in, you know a little bit about some of the strategies that you're, you're using to, to be able to maybe move away from that. Yeah, I mean, that is sort of the name of the game. It's like brutal, it's rejection, it's like, uh, every week is like a forest fire and then they're just like a few gags that remain standing in the rubble. Um, because I am, I'm getting about probably 2000 cartoons sent to me every week and we buy 20. Each issue has, you know, 15, sometimes fewer. Um, so it is just a sort of brutal culling. Uh, part of what I've tried to do by introducing more venues online for longer form comics or for like responsive, uh, more more responsive daily things, not just in the morning, but sometimes in the afternoon, um, is just to sort of create an ecosystem where people can be making work that is not just the gags that are sent into the ether and occasionally bought. Um, there's not much to do about the brutal math of it all uh, beyond try to encourage people and help them not lose faith in the whole endeavor after being rejected or hearing nothing week after week. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's a lot of just like cheerleading and empathy and uh, trying to like really stand by the people who I want to continue submitting so that they don't just decide to go back to many of one of their probably many other jobs because being a gag cartoonist is like not for most people, uh, a career at this point. That's true. So, so you're able to work with some people who you're trying to kind of develop into. Uh, yeah, and whether that's like a longer form stuff that runs, I mean, we run a comic online every day and multiple sort of more editorial cartoons every day, um, or just sort of like giving them specific feedback on submissions that came close and trying to remind them that they're, you know, they're not alone in being rejected, that even the people who have been submitting and publishing for decades are face a lot of rejection in this too. So how do you strike the balance? You obviously inherited, you know, a large group of, of talented cartoonists that were regulars, uh, but you've also made an effort to bring in new voices and that's been a goal. So how do, how do you strike that balance? It's a, it's like the main question of my job because I do have this dual imperative to both like prove myself to be a worthy advocate for these incredible people who have been publishing since before I was born and also 
I mean, what the New Yorker does across mediums, I think, is is showcase the work of the very best people working in different formats, whether it's fiction or reporting or poetry or um, photo. Uh, and I just think there's this incredibly huge, diverse wealth of voices in the comic, working in the comic arts sort of in a general way um, these days. And the New Yorker should be showcasing them. Not all, not everybody wants to do this weird thing that is the single panel gag cartoon. It's very concise. It's sort of stifling for people who think in longer narrative ways, I think. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just, I like spend part of my time is <laughs> trying to reassure people who feel neglected or, you know, and I spend half of my time trying to reach out to as many people who I find exciting as possible and encouraging them to submit to the New Yorker. Um, but yeah, it's a constant. I don't think it will ever level out. <laughs> Well, I think as a New Yorker reader that you've done a good job because I still am happy to see a lot of my favorite artists there and, and also, you know, to hear from new people. Um, so let's turn to the cartoonists and I'm interested to know how you first came to be published in the New Yorker. Um, let's start with Roz. Um, I started, uh, as mentioned before, in 1978. Um, I had recently graduated from uh, art school and started taking around a portfolio. Um, I of actually at the beginning, it was mostly illustrations. I never thought I would be able to make a living as a cartoonist because I didn't know where I fit in. You know, my stuff did not, and this was so long ago, my, my stuff did not look like uh, underground cartoons. I didn't feel like I fit in there and I didn't feel like I fit in in the more overground or for lack of a better word, cartoons. I did not do straight gag cartoons that appeared in the New Yorker. I really had no idea where they fit in. Um, and uh, I, I started taking around the cartoons. And, and for a while in the beginning of 1978, I was actually getting published in uh, National Lampoon. Um, they had the funny pages and, and also, um, uh, the Village Voice, where that was where I thought if I were very, very, very lucky, uh, maybe I would get a permanent place there because they published very idiosyncratic uh, personal stuff like uh, Jules Pfeiffer stuff and, um, and Stan Mack and Mark Allen Stamity. And I thought, well, maybe my stuff sort of looks more like that because it's, you know, very uh, my own style and they're not gag cartoons. And, um, and but then one day in April of 78, I thought, well, my, you know, I grew up reading The New Yorker um, and uh, I knew that they published cartoons, obviously. I mean, many of my heroes were published there, you know, I, Charles Adams and all these other people. And I thought, well, you know, there's nothing to lose. They're not going to take me, but I might as well give them a try. So I did not know how to do this. I did call up and found out their drop-off day and I put all my stuff, it must've been about 60 cartoons in an envelope and dropped them off. And I went back the next week to pick them up, very completely fully accept, uh, expecting that they were not going to accept anything. And that was okay with me because I was gonna be a cartoon for the, for the Village Voice. And uh, instead, there was a note from Lee Lorenz, who was the cartoon editor at the time, saying, uh, he was the art editor, actually. He did the cartoons and the covers. Um, and he s said to come back and see him. And um, I was very, very, very confused by this because this was not the script that I had written in my head. And uh, I went back and saw him and he told me to start coming back every week in person, um, which was, I didn't know at the time, but that was really you had to be invited to come back in person in those days otherwise there were many people who had been submitting for years and they had even bought from them but they didn't get back to go back with the regular cartoonists um but lee invited me to come back and it was very uh strange i was not only the only woman but i was like a million years younger than anybody else uh you know because when you're 23 i was 23 anybody over like 35 looks like they might as well be 55 or 85, you know, no idea. Um, 
And I didn't really talk to anybody for a very long time. It was really quite terrifying. Uh, and then at the end of the year, they put me um, under contract. But at the beginning, people hated my stuff. Um, it, or a lot of people did. Lee actually told me years later that some of the older cartoonists were so upset by my stuff that one of them asked if he owed my family money, if Lee owed my family money. Um, but, you know, they, it was uh, like a, a, a miracle in a, in a way. Uh, and, and every day I feel like I'm uh, in extremely grateful and, and still surprised, still surprised. I'm still expecting at any minute, you know, that they're going to say, actually, we made this horrible mistake and we hate you. So it is, I'm, you know, grateful does not begin to express how I feel about The New Yorker. But, so that's it. Well, I think it was an inspired choice on his part to uh, to include you, and it was really a new direction and a big change at the time. Yeah, it was. It's still. I still feel like I don't quite fit in, which is sort of strange, you know, because it's still. Every once in a while, there's I do something that I think of as a sort of straight-ish sort of gag, but I just don't. I don't think that way, you know, and I guess that's really where a lot of the gratitude comes in that um, nobody's made me uh, try to be, try to think in a way that I don't think or be um, a cartoonist that I'm not. I've been allowed to uh, express myself how I, how I want to. And that makes me so grateful that I just want to do the best every week, you know, that I can. Um, so anyway, not to be so corny and disgusting about it. Oh, that's the advice I give too, to all of the cartoonists who are just starting out and they're like, what should I do? And I say like, stop trying to make cartoons that look like what you think a New Yorker cartoon is. Like, what do you think is funny? How do you like to draw? Like, <laughs> what, what are you drawing that makes you laugh? Like, what are the things that you hear and see and think that... And that's how I feel too. I mean, I feel like what, why else would you do this if it weren't how you want to do it you know it's not like by imitating a new yorker cartoon or do or you know mastering that you're going to get rid it's like there's no <laughs> point, you know there's no point in faking it uh maybe like if the if the new yorker like paid a million dollars a cartoon i'd be better at faking it but like there's <laughs> no reason you know you might as well follow your own instincts you know that's that is great advice that is great advice and i think your work is is a perfect example of that it really shows it um, but let's hear from amy um about how you uh first started getting published in the new yorker what's your story well i i've been working full-time at an architecture firm for a while i was probably about 29 or so when i decided like i'm gonna seriously start submitting to the new yorker and um when i started they took submissions by snail mail. So I remember that's how I knew how to do it. Um, there was no, there, it wasn't posted anywhere on how to submit to the New Yorker, but I think I read enough, I, I sort of read newspaper articles and get little snippets of information. And I, re, I, from, I guess, all the little bits and pieces, I was like, well, they're expecting 10 a week. So I'll just send in 10 a week um, with a self-addressed stamped envelope so they can return. I, I kind of figured all that out just the basic information. So I did that um, once a week for about 10 months before I sold one. And Bob Mankoff called me at my office. At, well, I was at my office <laughs> and you know, they had cell phones by then. Um, and he said, I sold a cartoon. So I was, I was pretty ecstatic because obviously for, you know, 10 months of doing this, you start to think, am I crazy? I'm spending all my free time doing this because back then it took me a lot longer just to you know, I wasn't drawing digitally. I was just like, you know, retracing, you know, my sketches over and over and trying to get it exactly right. I was still trying to figure out my style. Um, so I was, I was pretty excited. And so that was the first cartoon I sold. I, I feel like I did not sell another one for over a year after that. So I was still, I still was submitting every week. Um, so it was slow going in the beginning. I feel like maybe the next year, maybe I sold one or maybe was the year after i i can't remember um but i might may have sold like two the next year three the next year it was i mean luckily i did have a full-time job so i wasn't reliant on my cartoon income to live off of because it would have been i would have been like living on a 
in a cardboard box on the street. <laughs> so I guess when I started, it was more, I saw it more as a hobby. I mean, that's the only way I could see it because, you know, when you're first starting out and if you're not doing it full time and like, if you don't have other kind of cartooning um, revenues of income or revenue streams, um, you know, it's, it's not really enough. <laughs> so I, so I guess I, you know, I built up the, my cartoon income over the years and it, it did get to a point where I, I think, you know, because it, it was, it was only like maybe a couple of years ago that I actually decided I'm quitting my job. I'm just going to do cartoons full time. And that was, I guess, a, a big leap for me. It was the next step. But I think I realized that I had enough momentum in my cartooning that I could, if I invested more time, I could you know propel it to actually I, you know if I invested more time I would make more money <laughs> and I felt like I was at a point where I didn't have enough time to invest because I had to be at a job all day and the way I saw my job was kind of this you know you get little raises here and there but it was sort of stagnating <laughs> for me that's how I felt and I guess maybe for me it was more emotionally too like I just was like is this what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life um and I didn't want to wait to do cartoons full-time when I was retiring <laughs> you know I was like that would to me would seem very sad <laughs> like oh well, finally I'm doing what I really wanted to do when I'm 70 you know I was a bit then I was like wait but I missed all the momentum I missed all of being able to build on it so for me it was sort of a, a timing issue um there are practical reasons also because I have a child and cartooning I think it's a great industry if you are a mom or a parent or your primary caregiver because you have tons of flexibility in um, your schedule and you know taking on jobs or not taking on jobs you don't have to take on jobs or the deadline is the next day you don't have to be at a certain place at a certain time you know i mean you can take on jobs that or do events you know like this um but you can also say no i'm not going to and do other things so well, that's sort of how yeah it's, uh, i'm sure it was a risk to to jump into that full time but obviously yeah. So yeah, it's far, you're a success story. Yeah, it's uh, so and another Liz, cartoonist who did that is Liz, and I want to bring in her a recording. Uh, she talks about how she first got published in the New Yorker. Um, I became published in the New Yorker in a super kind of roundabout way. I was on Instagram uh, while I was working as a graphic designer at the time, uh, and was scrolling through the New Yorker cartoons Instagram, which at the time was my only frame of reference for the New Yorker. I I kind of, you know, peripherally knew it was a magazine, but not really. Um, so I was just scrolling through the Instagram and was like, oh, wow, like all the cartoons are white. All the characters are white, like that, which probably means all the people making them are white and all the people editing them are white. And I was like, maybe they just don't know. You know, I was 22, fresh out of school, super naive. And so I just emailed, I just clicked the email button on Instagram and um, sent email like, hey, guys, you know, big fan, but you guys should have some more diversity. Um, would love to see some more, you know, black characters. And to my shock, uh, Emma responded to me and was like, oh, is there anyone that you would recommend? And I, I said, me, I recommended myself. And then many, many cartoons and drafts later, like at least 50, one finally got published, the per my last email one, which was my first cartoon from the New Yorker. And then there's been like a, a bunch since. So Emma, Liz's story is somewhat unique, but it really does speak to something I think that you've been really working on, which is diversifying the voices um, in the magazine. Um, so obviously people are submitting all the time. Uh, do, you, do you also actively go out and, and seek out people who you might want to contribute? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a big part of my job and one of the most sort of fun parts of my job. Um, I was trying to remember how it happened in pre-COVID times, but I mean, I used to like travel around to different cities and make beelines to the, make a beeline to the comic book store and check out all the local zine racks and talk to the owners about who they were excited about on the local scene. Um, but despite being very competitive, the world of cartooning is also, um, I don't know, people tend to be very supportive of one another, I found. So asking the cartoonist for who they are excited about, who they're reading, um, a lot of the cartoonists teach and asking them to send their promising students my way. Um, I did in pre-COVID times have sort of open uh, office hours on Tuesdays where anyone could come in <laughs> and present their work to me. Um, so I had a lot of interesting conversations that way. 
um, met some really intriguing people, um, going to conventions and all these things that seem so foreign and somewhat terrifying now because <laughs> just cramped convention halls full of cartoonists just breathing on <laughs> one another. But um, yeah, and there are all these, uh, one of the great resources uh, during quarantine was Abel Hayford, who's a cartoonist who we've published on Daily Shouts, put together an incredible spreadsheet of black illustrators. Um, Mary Naomi, who we've also published, has put together these amazing databases of um, cartoonists of color, queer cartoonists, disabled cartoonists. So, I mean, I feel like increasingly, certainly the world of comics and the world of cartooning, when I came to it, was hugely skewed white and male, I think, um, despite the members of this panel. But I think there's like increasing visibility and opportunity and there are a lot of people working really hard to make sure that the people who are having, getting opportunities to publish and get book deals, it's a sh shifting landscape and I'm trying to be part of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and uh, you know, again, as, as a reader, and it's great to see that. Well, and there's no, there's no better. I mean, Liz was like the ideal thing because you get someone who writes an incredibly thoughtful letter about their experience and what they're seeing in the magazine and you ask for a recommendation and it just turns out that the person who wrote to you is a wildly talented cartoonist with a very unique point of view and like a fully developed style. I mean, it doesn't get really better than that editorially. That's true. Uh, so New Yorker style gag cartoons in some ways seem like they should be old fashioned given their long history, but instead they're also in, in a way like uniquely suited to this current um, environment where people want like quick visually appealing humor that surprises them that they can share on social media. Um, so I guess Emma, if you could talk a little bit about the online and social media presence and then I'll ask Roz and Amy to talk about whether there's opportunities or challenges uh, in this current tech uh, and social media climate. So we'll yeah. start with Emma. I mean, I, I always sort of say that the cartoon is a little bit of a proto meme, because like if you think of the cheeseburger cat or whatever, that's just like a weird font New Yorker cartoon. Um, so they're definitely shareable. Um, and they can be quick and responsive and move around the internet uh, with ease, I think. Lena Fader, who's someone at the New Yorker, created shortly before I became cartoon editor, uh, New Yorker cartoon Instagram, and uh, it was just wildly popular. <laughs> I mean, she like it, it just started as sort of a, a fun project for her, and um, people respond to cartoons. I mean, she publishes both. She posts both things that are in the current issue of the magazine, or were daily cartoons that day or that week, and things that were published in the '30s and some of them still resonate, some of them feel fresh. There are certainly ones from earlier eras that make no sense whatsoever to me. But um, I think there is, it is one of the great um, exciting ways that I think gag cartoons are having a new life um, in this current moment and a way for people who are trying to become gag cartoonists to get their work out there, even though there aren't all the print publications that there once were publishing these, these single panel gags. Yeah, absolutely. Amy, do you want to comment on that at all? Um, I guess in terms of social media and gag cartoons, I, I am finding that um, gag cartoons are great for social media because I think a lot of people need that, I guess, you know, their, their attention spans are shorter now. <laughs> Nobody wants to like read, a, you know, multiple panels of a cartoon necessarily, and especially for things like Instagram, where it usually is a single panel, that's what you see immediately. Um, companies have reached out to me just like asking for cartoons because I think people can see it, they get it immediately, and, you know, they might share it with another, you know, with their followers or their friends. Um, so I, I do think the gag cartoon is very, I guess, conducive to that formatting of um, Instagram, I guess Twitter also. I'm not on Twitter. I'm only on Instagram and Facebook. Um, but um, what, wait, what, what else did you ask? I just want to make sure I'm not going. I'm, I was just asking about challenges and opportunities with the, this environment. Um, I guess tech, particularly with, with New Yorker type cartoons. New Yorker type cartoons. Um, I don't. I mean, I guess there's always challenges. I think the main challenge, I think a lot of people are having, I, I know when I first started, a lot of people 
I, earlier on, people were thinking, oh, you shouldn't put your work out there for free, you know, because obviously Instagram's not paying you to just post your cartoons. But I think I started it on with this attitude of it's marketing research. I'll see which ones that people actually react to, respond to, you know, because I, otherwise these cartoons are just sitting, you know, in my computer and nobody sees them. Um, another um, aspect I had when I started doing it was, or posting, say, my rejects. Obviously I post reje things that have been rejected like multiple times already. <laughs> so I wanna give them a chance to make some money for me. But um, I also, I would, um, I would do it also to, now I'm trying to think, I can't even remember what I was going to say, but <laughs> I think, oh, also I, I felt like some, some cartoons have a limited shelf life and sometimes multiple people have the same idea. So sometimes I see somebody else posting a cartoon that's very similar to one that I had done, but I never got mine out there. So I'm like, you know, maybe I should release my stuff out there more often because it gets seen and people understand you as a cartoonist better. I think people will appreciate your work if they understand you and they don't understand you unless if they see a wide variety of your work, you know, they'll, yeah. they'll never go, oh, who's Amy? If they just see three cartoons, but if they see like a hun hundreds of them, then it kind of builds on itself. Then they might think your not funny cartoons are funny just because they think you're funny. Roz, do you want to add anything? Uh, they both said it pretty much uh, yeah, I, I, the only social media thing I do is Instagram. Um, I like it not just for posting cartoons, but I post, you know, as I said earlier, I sometimes get involved in odd craft things. Like right now I'm going through a big Pisanki egg phase and, uh, I've been posting a lot of those and, um, you know, just what we were saying before, I just, I can't, I don't just do cartoons. I, I, do these other art projects as well. And I can post pictures of that. And also I get to see, I get to discover other cartoonists work that uh, I, people that I never would have seen had it not been for social media and, you know, specifically Instagram. So I like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, Instagram is a great way. Uh, I have found also just, especially now in sort of semi-lockdown to mm -hmm. find other people's, to find new, uh, artists work because even just going through who other cartoonists follow um, yeah. and people, people I, as I said are very generous about like posting and promoting work that they're into um, and so I always have a it's right now it's really bad it's like 80 tabs but I sort of like screenshot different artists pages or Instagram profiles and then like every week or so I send out a bunch of notes to people just saying that I dig their stuff but yeah a lot of it does come from Instagram Yes. Great. So I, I do want to play one more clip um, from Liz. Uh, she talks a little bit about getting published in The New Yorker and kind of the, the tech environment. I think it's interesting what you say, because she had earlier pointed out that she was actually not familiar with The New Yorker magazine, but she knew about it from their Instagram account. So, um, so let's play that clip. Oh, yeah. I think that, like, especially in, like, the very social media driven world that we have right now, um, there's definitely, like, uh, the field is very saturated of visual art, of cartoons, illustrations, which I think is a good thing. I think more is always better. The more perspectives, the better. Um, but, you know, being published in The New Yorker definitely, like, adds legitimacy and, like, that brand recognition of, oh, you do that for them. So then, you know, you're legitimate. I mean, unfortunately, that's needed, um, you know, in the society that we live in. Um, so that, I mean, that's great because it open it does open a lot of doors and it does make me feel like I, I really do this. I'm a professional. Um, so, you know, if anything, the confidence it gives me in myself, 10 out of 10, I'll take it. Okay, great. So we've got a lot of questions coming in. Um, from our audience uh, and our time has just been flying by. So I did want to just uh, briefly ask both um, Roz and uh, Liz to talk a little bit about your your thought process when you're when you're doing cartoons. So one of the things that I really love about New Yorker cartoons, most of them, the images and the text are really interdependent. So you have to um, see both the image and the text. And I think Amy, you showed a perfect example of that with the cartoon um, with the binoculars and the park. And it was you know this has a has a park view, but you have to see the image to really um, to fully appreciate the cartoon. So um, 
if both of you could maybe just say a little bit briefly about your, your process. Do you start by drawing or writing or a combination of the two or does it vary? And uh, let's start with Roz. Um, it really varies a lot. I would say, though mostly uh, the, the words come first, although occasionally the picture comes first, I'm just doodling. I jot things down. I have a little notebook, but the idea is sometimes I, don't, I can't find the notebook, so then it's on a little piece of paper. I have a box in my studio, which is sort of my idea box. And if you ever just looked at it, you would think these are you know, the thoughts of a crazy person. It's just sometimes they're just fragments or weird doodles. It'll be like a bird with like a little crown on his head or just, I'll just say chessboard, and then I'll look at it later and think like, what was I thinking? I don't even know what this refers to. Because uh, I think that when I'm sitting at my desk, I, I pull these ideas out and I look at them and it's, it's almost like a jumping off point. And then, I don't know, it's very hard to put into words what it is what it is we do. I, I, I will tell you that uh, once my son came into my studio and he saw me sitting at my desk and I was just like, and he said, mom, what are you doing? You're just like this. And that's, you know, I think I'd spend a lot of time just kind of sitting and I'm thinking and I start drawing it and some, and sometimes I have to draw it many times to kind of find the right way to do all of these things. It's very, it's hard to, I'm trying to, you know, something pops into my head, this is funny and I want to draw it out. And sometimes like uh, I, there's cartoons once in a blue moon, it's like I get the idea, I see it in my head and I can draw it and it's done. But a lot of times it's sort of, teasing it out and I have to explore it this way and I have to explore it that way. And it's the same thing like with the, with when I have an idea and I know that something is there, like that's, that's why the resubmission, Emma. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I know that there is an idea and I ha and sometimes if it gets rejected, I'll wait a while and then I'll pull it out. And I very rarely resubmit it as I did it at first. It's like, I have to somehow figure out the best way to get what I thought was funny in the best, the shortest, the funniest way. So I, I know that this is probably like some weird tautology. It's like, how do you work? That's, this is, you know, I work like how I work. I, you know, so sorry. No, that's great. That's great. I love it. Amy? Um, my answer is probably very similar to Roz's. Every now and then I, an idea comes to me fully formed and it, it's like, oh, I have the caption, I have the drawing and it's like perfect, but that's very rare for me. And usually um, I find I have an idea and it's not funny and I just keep tweaking it and tweaking it. And sometimes I, I might change the caption so it's saying the exact opposite of what it originally said and it's funny that way, <laughs> which is strange because you think, okay, the opposite would mean it's not funny, but it actually would make it funny or maybe it's a the people the person saying it i switch it to the other person saying it to you know it it i find it's more um changing maybe a single little aspect in a cartoon and and i think it's that that kind of makes um that unexpected humor that makes i guess because humor is usually something that's a surprise or it's unexpected it's not you know, the everyday. Um, and things like the cartoon with the window, um, this window has a view of the park. That's one where sometimes I find it's easy to come up with a caption that's just something that some people say all the time. And then maybe coming up with a drawing that's a little off. <laughs> that's, you know, not, not typical. Um, and I guess other than that, I, it, great. it's kind of just tweaking it, it yeah. really, or simplifying. A lot of times it's taking away you yeah. know, making I think some of us that don't draw just imagine these cartoons just form fully form they pop into your head um, <laughs> and it sounds like that's not how it works at all <laughs> no and I think also people sometimes are like oh like all these things must be things overheard on the crosstown bus like cartoonists are just like going around in their trench coats like writing down funny <laughs> situations in the world which is like I having talked to many of you like fun is very rarely the case it's like very rare. much more of a process of just absorbing and thinking and making that Roz face of. <laughs> right, synthesizing, it's having to synthesize all that. <laughs> yeah, no, okay. but it is, so, I'm oh, sorry. I was gonna say, let's uh, have a, a question from our audience. Um, Jeannie McCorney says, has the fact that you are female held you back or helped, or do you have stories related to being female in a male dominated art form? And this probably goes to all of you. Well, 
should I? I'll just say that I once was doing a talk at Yale and um, this guy who was wearing full body bike spandex and was like sprawled out in the back during the Q&A asked if how I could pick jokes as a woman that were funny for men. <laughs> I, it's the most direct version of the question I've ever gotten. <laughs> and, and one that came packaged in a great outfit. But um, I mean, I think versions of that I've definitely sort of heard through the whatever actual question people were asking. And at first I felt sort of, I don't know, like I needed to apologize in some way for being me and being in charge of this incredibly valuable, storied, venerable thing. Um, but eventually I realized that, you know, David Remnick picked me to do this job because I'm me, not in, not in spite of the fact that I'm me um, and that I will certainly always have particular aversions um, like nagging wife cartoons and bad puns and cartoons where the joke is just that one person misheard what the other person <laughs> said. Um, and I will publish many more cartoons about like horses and cheese but that's okay. <laughs> no one, no well, one. It's an interesting question because, you know, you're the first woman who's been the New Yorker cartoon editor. And so we can switch that around and say, well, men have been choosing what they think women will find funny for all these years. So um, actually the other question was when I first started, there was, I was doing a segment. I don't think it ever aired. Um, and the camera guy asked me, if I was going to publish different types of cartoons as a woman. And I was like really pissed off and said I was only going to publish cartoons about menstruation. And he, <laughs> his face just like fell. <laughs> I've never seen anyone look so alarmed. <laughs> what about you, Roz? Uh, I, it's funny. It's not something that I thought very much when I was starting. I don't know why that probably speaks volumes about me, how you know, my problems. But um, <laughs> uh, when I, I, from the time I was in about fourth or fifth grade, I always signed my stuff with my initial. And I don't really know why I have drawings that I did from when I was a kid with an R. So I know when I submitted my stuff to the New Yorker for the first time, um, it was under, with my initial. Um, and so Lee didn't know when he pulled me out of the slush pile that I was female. However, that being said, when I came back to meet him, I feel like I checked a couple of boxes, you know, that probably that time in 78, I have a feeling that they were probably thinking, this is kind of a sausage party around here. And maybe it would be kind of nice to have, maybe it's time we have, so, okay, box one, and also, the fact that I was so young. So I think that in some ways it helped me hmm. being okay. familiar. But yeah, I mean, there were weird comments. I, I remember once going to some book party and, and a man said, I didn't really know that women could be ironic. <laughs> and it was like, well, I guess, you know, <laughs> this is a pretty ironic conversation, is it not? <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I, I I just didn't really think about it that much. Amy? Um, I, th I th definitely think it has helped, mainly in the sense of when you're one of the few. And for me, I'm, I was probably one of the first Asian people and females. And, you know, you show, when I first started, you know, I'd go into the cartoon meetings and it's mostly men, mostly older men. Um, but I, I always felt like that was a reason to keep going and not Quit. Like I was like I I got in here I can't leave because right now I feel like well there there are a lot more Asian people there are a lot more women so I'm like oh the pressure is off a little bit like obviously I'm not gonna leave but I but I I guess I did feel this pressure like okay I got in and I need to stay in and keep doing this because the number our numbers are still low <laughs> so I just didn't want to because I I guess I felt like oh the New Yorkers counting on me to be representative of my my race my uh, my gender um that sort of thing and mm -hmm. i guess when you do that you you get better because you keep doing it yeah. so and i you also i guess i also felt that you don't want people to think that um you were chosen because you're a female or because you're a minority and i think but i think it's true of anybody starting out that they're, you're, they're kind of on shaky ground because you're still developing your style. You, you're, you know, I think anybody's first cartoons, 
nobody feels, oh, I'm a genius and I'm in, you know, I, I, maybe some people think that, but I definitely didn't feel secure in the New Yorker for many years and feeling like, okay, I'm, I'm a stable producing cartoonist. Emma? I was just going to say that, that there's sort of crazy stats in that in 1925, in the first issue of the magazine, there were women cartoonists. It wasn't until about two, two and a half years ago that there was an issue with more women cartoonists in it than men, which does not in any way <laughs> reflect the larger, wider world of cartooning and even our contributor pool. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> well, that's, an, that's an interesting milestone. Uh, so we are coming to the end here. We're a little bit over, but if you guys can stay for just a couple more minutes. Um, we've had a couple different questions about how cartooning or your cartooning has changed or maybe Emma, you know, how you're selecting cartoons uh, since the pandemic started. Anybody who wants to take a crack at that can go for it. I can say that I have been, I haven't been able to produce nearly as much because I have a child and schools were closed for multiple months. I'm still, I'm doing full remote right now with my kid and her dad is watching her a couple of the days that I'm still, I'm still losing work hours. So I'm, I feel a little frustrated because I do feel like there's a lot that could be said during the pandemic amongst people who have lost time to work. <laughs> yeah, we don't have time to, <laughs> you're a cartoonist, you don't have time to draw about stuff like that. <laughs> so it is, I do feel very frustrated in some ways and I keep thinking, well, when it's over, maybe I'll draw a cartoon about it, but I feel like by then it'll, I'll be done and over with. Like it's 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 hard to be in the moment and be a cartoonist when you're. I, I guess if you're any parent, not just females or moms, but because usually the parent who's a cartoonist is the primary caregiver because the cartoonist is the one who has flexibility in their schedule and can work from home. So usually you're the one watching the kid <laughs> if you have a young child. So that I feel like. I haven't done many pandemic cartoons and I feel like I'm a repressed cartoonist right now. I haven't been producing nearly as much as I normally would have. So that's how it's changed. Understandable. I also have a young child and I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Anybody my, else? My kids are out of the house. Uh, but I've, I've actually in some ways enjoyed this time. I have uh, less, I'm, there are less sort of running around type activities and uh, also the topic of the pandemic and um, is, is for me one that I'm more inspired by than certain political things, which just seem like the same old, same old uh, certain aspects, especially at the beginning of you know, panic buying and um, just even going to the supermarket. Sometimes there were like weird situations of going there and seeing there's like, you know, two cans, like dented cans of garbanzo beans, like, and which, who, which cart is going to get them? Like, is somebody going to take both cans or are they going to take one can because they don't want to clean out the entire shelf? And even just like recently, you know, my supermarket, uh, doesn't is not stack stocking um the regular brands of paper towels there are like really weird brands <laughs> there like ole and like you know whoever heard of that what is that or like mighty queen paper towels you know and they come from like bosnia or something you know and it, it's just uh it's it's been a very interesting time to be drawing um, I feel like that could be a Roz Chass cartoon. Well, I mean, I was going to say, Roz, like this, I feel like a lot of topics, pandemic topics, the Venn diagram of those and things that are already sort of like your neuroses obsessions. Yeah, yeah. So many of pans, like stockpiling, <laughs> like yeah. collections of things, um, <laughs> the way people interact in crowded spaces, uh, germs, like, right. <laughs> like you were sort of set up. <laughs> <laughs> the, the anxiety of it. I mean, I feel like I'm generally in a sort of uh, anxious state and this has just ramped it up. So, and, and often I do find that anxiety, not always. I mean, there are certain anxieties that have nothing, they don't overlap with humor at all, but I have definitely had anxieties where they sort of tip over into, you know, at least when the anxiety passes into something that's funny, like, you know, 
years ago, I had this horrible thing. I was in the bathtub and I convinced myself that because we live in an old house, that the tub was going to fall through the floor uh, like, and, and kill me, that I was going to actually... And I was really scared. And then like later I got out of the tub. I like, I hurried, I got out of the tub. And then it just seemed very funny to me later. Uh, but at the time it was not funny at all. It was, I was really quite serious. And then recently I did learn about somebody who was in their attic and they fell through floors down through the attic. So this is like, it really happened to somebody. She wasn't in the tub, but still it was like somebody falling through. I don't know what, that, <laughs> this has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> Let me just really rewind. Forget I mentioned anything. Good story, though. It, beware, beware, everybody. Beware. beware of floors. Walking on the floor. And you're just taking your life in your hands. Just don't move at all. Just sit still. It, is, it has been interesting, fascinating to see how people, cartoonists, have responded. Because I think at first, people were just in shock and trying to, you know, bat down the hatches, like, get somewhere safe, buy toilet paper. And there wasn't there was sort of a break where people didn't know what type of jokes to make. And then a lot of people made the same jokes, like yes. being on a desert island would be great right now, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Like cruise ship, don't come pick me up. Cruise ships are terrible. <laughs> um, but then to the various waves of types of jokes that people have made and then having to figure out when to run them, things that suddenly no longer feel relevant because we're in a whole different stage of this thing. Um, then just having this whole backlog of cartoons of people in crowds at theaters and that just feel like it would be sort of um, almost like a public disservice to run them right now, like irresponsible to run these cartoons with all these unmasked people just in each other's aerosol spaces. Yeah, um, it is weird to sort of watch TV shows or movies and most of them, like 99.9 .9 or like pre-pandemic and people, it's like, look at all those people in a restaurant they're like eating they're so close together look at that yeah that's that's not, i find myself problem. saying like back up back up like you're talking too close to each other <laughs> I know, <it's> very strange. <laughs> great well i think we're at a good stopping point i'm really sorry we didn't have more time for our um, viewers questions we had some some other great ones uh but i really thank thank you three um emma Roz, and amy and thank you for all the great work that you're doing. Um, and also thank you to Liz, who couldn't be with us, but I hope that she'll be able to, to take a look at this and, and we'll have her back at the Billy Ireland at some point in the future. So um, again, thank you everybody. This has been a real pleasure. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks Amy. Bye, guys. Bye.